So great to give a talk in front of people again. It's not uh, so often uh, it's happening. So good to see you all. And also thank you for a very nice uh, dinner last uh, night. So um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, something slightly different about a class of materials that I've been working with for the last uh, 10, 12 years. And it is uh, materials called uh, molecular photoswitches. So it's basically a molecule, you shine light on it, and it change shape into another isomer. This other isomer can have other properties. It can have a different melting point. It can also have another energy, maybe. Uh, and uh, then when you are done with playing with this one, you can maybe switch it back again to the original one. And then you have basically two materials in one that you can manipulate with light. And in, in, in the project I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about how we are engineering this for a certain property. So we have one material that switches into the other one, but we want the energy of the second one to be higher so that we can store some energy here. And uh, this is basically uh, what my story is about. It's how we are doing molecular engineering. We are changing the properties of the molecules to improve uh, this function. But we are also integrated this into devices. And in the end, I will tell you a little bit about how this is connected maybe to, to your project of trying to get electricity uh, out of heat. Let's see if it works. It works, actually. So let uh, me start with my normal motivation. This is supposed to be a very uh, polluted uh, um, place uh, on Earth, maybe a big city. Maybe, maybe it's not Barcelona. It's very clean air here, of course. But, but the argument is that uh, even in Sweden, where we don't have so big cities, uh, it's estimated that 7,600 people die too early each year due to air pollution. And the EU level, it's 800,000. And on average, we lose two years of our lives uh, for breathing uh, bad air. And I, I think this is a very good argument, an argument that everyone can understand when we talk about uh, CO2 uh, or burning things. Uh, this creates air pollution. And it's much more personal, in my view, than talking about global warming or something that will happen uh, half a degree in the next decade. I mean, it's very difficult to relate to for the individual, but everyone can relate to that they are dying two years too early, that, that the air pollution is stealing two years of their life. It's actually 15 years if you live in India and eight years if you live in China. Uh, so it's quite significant amount of uh, time that you are losing on this planet because of that we are burning things. So the one take home message is I think we should stop burning things in general. Uh, but that's my first motivation. Luckily, there are different efforts to, to try to change this. And one of them is to build uh, solar cells and, uh, and, and wind turbines. But, but there are several challenges with this. One of them is that sometimes the wind blows, sometimes not. The sun shines during the day, not so much during the night. In Sweden, uh, maybe not so much during the winter either. So you get a very variable output of this. And the energy need is also very variable. It's not the same energy consumption that we have at every given moment. Uh, so we need to be able to store this. But one more problem that has become much more evident in the last uh, one and a half months, actually, is that electric power is only 25% of our energy consumption in EU. The end use of energy is actually half of it is heating. And, uh, and a lot of that comes from burning things like uh, gas or oil or coal. Um, so uh, also some uh, biomass. But, uh, but, but this is half of the energy consumption in EU. And that is why it's different, difficult to move away from imported gas from uh, some countries. And a lot of this is the low temperature heat, meaning that it's lower than 150 degrees. This could be heating a house, ensuring the correct temperature of some chemical process in industry, uh, something like that, baking bread. Uh, and that is the temperature range where 
that we are trying to target with our research. So we are trying to develop new types, new ways to heat something. Some new ways where you don't have to burn anything. So how can we do that? Um, just a, a quote from a, a famous Italian uh, uh, photochemist or photophysicist, depending on your mindset. Uh, he said in uh, Science in 1912 that with the relatively small reserves of coal that the past geological epoch have stored for us, it will never be desirable to produce from coal what nature generously offers us through solar energy. So already um, 112 uh, years ago, uh, 111 years ago, he, uh, he uh, thought about this and, um, and thought we should not burn things. But the problem is uh, it's difficult to get around it because we don't have the technologies to, uh, to avoid burning things. So, so what can we do about it? Uh, if you look at chemical ways to source solar energy, uh, the most used one is the uh, biological systems. I mean, uh, plants, uh, they convert uh, photons into stored chemical energy in, for example, cellulose materials. But there are also other uh, more recent uh, alternatives like photo-induced water splitting, uh, artificial photosynthesis, and then something that maybe you have never heard about before, we call it a molecular solar thermal system. That's uh, uh, the difference between these is that all of these have some kind of storage component that is burned and converted back to something else and uh, exchanging materials uh, with the surroundings, like you consume oxygen to produce some CO2, and then you make the CO2 back to some something. But our system is completely closed cycle. There's a simple output is photons, input is photons, output is heat on demand. There's no exchange of materials, only uh, energy in and out. So how could it look? Uh, this is a sketch uh, of, of how the system could look. We start with what we call the parent molecule. So it's a starting, the starting point, the first photoisomer. And then we shine light on it and it converts into a photoisomer. And this one should be stable over time. So it can just sit there, room temperature, no heating is happening. Then when we want the heat out, uh, we, we trigger the heat release in some way and then recover our original molecule. And then we can continue the cycle again and again. Uh, this is a picture or illustration of how it could be. We start pumping the molecule into some collector, convert, store, extract the energy, uh, and recover again and use the heat for something. So if we could make this, uh, it would have some possible advantages. It would be a, a closed system. There's no, no combustion, no burning going on here. Uh, it could have high energy densities, long-term storage. And since it's a chemical transformation, as opposed to traditional thermal storage materials, we don't need any insulation. So we can just store it somewhere uh, without having to build a, a pressurized tank or an isolated tank, uh, insulated tank. And we don't need any solar concentrators to reach higher temperatures because we can spend a lot of time here capturing energy and then release a lot of it in a little time here to reach the temperatures we need. The uh, only problem is uh, with this vision is that the uh, the super material that does not exist. So uh, that is uh, sort of uh, what our research is about, is to try to, to figure out how to do this. Uh, and that is sort of the theme of uh, this talk, is to uh, give you a little bit of a, a, a story about how we have engineered molecular systems to be able to do this uh, during the last 10 years or so. Uh, we are not alone with this. Several different research groups study different molecular photo switch systems. And let me just go through them briefly. So this is a, called no bond adiene. It has two double bonds here. When you shine light on it, it forms uh, these uh, cyclopropane rings. And, and there's a lot of strain here. So the molecule uh, can, uh, this one has high energy, this has lower energy. There's also this one, uh, azobenzene and uh, variants, where you have a transform, it's a low energy form, and then the high energy cis form. And, and here it's about engineering. So you get strain uh, in this interaction between the R group and the benzene ring here in order to maximize the, the difference in energy between the two. 
also this one, the dihydroazoline that converts into vinyl heptafulvin. Uh, this is another uh, photo switch system. And there are a few others that people are exploring in this uh, research field. Uh, if you look at it from an energy landscape or a reaction uh, energy landscape uh, point of view, uh, just to introduce you to some of the things we are trying to work with here, we have the, the first molecule here. It absorbs uh, light under normal light absorption, becomes an excited state. It travels uh, on this uh, excited energy surface. And, and this should be shaped so that when it goes back, it falls down in a, in a, in a well here where it can sit and, and keep the energy, uh, the storage energy. When we then want the energy back, there should be a way to trigger the back reaction either by giving it enough uh, thermal energy to overcome this barrier or by catalysis. Uh, and then we get this heat out. That, that could also be a competing process uh, they can, this can be good or bad. Another wavelength of light that can be used to, to take the molecule uh, back towards the starting point again. Um, if, uh, I, I will come back to, to when this could be a problem or when this could be good uh, 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 later. And of course, this, this process uh, has to run more than one time. If it has to be meaningful, if it should be a heat battery, it should be used again and again thousands of times. So, so, so this turns out to be our favorite of the three uh, examples. This is called norbonadiene. It's, it's a, a name derived from a natural substance uh, found on Borneo, uh, close to, uh, yeah. So, so, so this is a, it's, it's a derivative or a structure you can also find somehow in literature, in, in the nature. Um, and then it can form the quadricyclane and it can store up to one megajoule per kilogram which is a little bit more than the state-of-the-art lithium-ion batteries. Uh, but the problem is that this molecule uh, only absorbs UV photons, and the so-called photo, uh, quant photochemical quantum yield is uh, only a few percent. So uh, this should be 100%. Every time we hit it with a photon, it should go here. And it should also be able to absorb a big part of the solar spectrum, right? So there are several things we have to fix here. Uh, and that is, uh, that is what I will show how we can do that. So, so by, by analyzing the problem, um, we, we, we found out that we should at least have an absorption onset in around 600 nanometer. Uh, it's a little bit lower than what you're trying to tackle with the organic solar cells uh, for some, um, uh, because there are more um, sort of built-in losses in the system. You need a little bit more higher energy in the photons. If you go back to this uh, slide here, uh, you can maybe see why this is the absorption uh, energy, and you have to, you will have some losses here, but you will also, you need to have this barrier. And in order to maximize uh, this energy, there needs to be, uh, this energy has to be somewhat higher than in a solar cell. There has to be, there, there are some prices to be paid here. We will never be able to have the same efficiency as a solar cell um, due to this. Uh, and therefore, the, the optimal absorption is around 600 uh, nanometer uh, of the onset. Uh, we should store uh, energy for a long time, and we should have a, a low mole uh, molecular mass because this is related to the energy density. If it weighs very little, then the, the, the joules per gram become small. So this is, we cannot just make a very heavy molecule and a small energy storage system then it will not heat up a lot when we release the heat. And uh, there's a target of 300 kilojoules per kilogram. This is to compete with the uh, hot water. Uh, hot water at the 85 degrees, I think, it stores roughly this uh, amount of energy. So when we started, there was uh, the original system was disco discovered, and also some others had worked on it. And this is one system from you see that where they use, explore a very special type of conjugation. You see here, you have two single bonds there. So the donor and acceptor part can actually electronically communicate. It's a little bit surprising, maybe if you work with uh, donor acceptor polymers or uh, conjugated polymers, that, that here there's a two-space coupling. You see the pi orbitals are pointing towards each other. 
because of the bending of the molecule. And therefore, there's actually electronic communication and you get a donor acceptor system uh, through space. It's called homo conjugation. Uh, but we wanted to, we, we took this and then thought, why not try to use modern synthesis to place the acceptor and the donor on the same side? Because then we can make everything lighter. We want to keep the mass down. So uh, we, 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 we focused on that. Uh, and we have just a little bit about how we work. We maybe start with some ideas from literature, uh, computational work. Then we do the making of the material. We do the synthesis. We test the properties. And maybe if they're very good, we also build some devices. And that's one of the, part, one of the things I will talk about later. Uh, so first, uh, why the absorption? Uh, <clears throat> this is the solar spectrum. And, and, and the, the more towards the red we can go, the bigger part of the solar spectrum we can harvest. So this is uh, natural uh, why we want this maybe. But the, the unsubstituted NBD absorbs uh, up to 300. So it's about here. So it doesn't really convert in, in sunlight. Uh, so these are the original system and our reduced uh, system, you can say. So in the first generation <coughs> of the molecules, we put on two benzene rings. And this changed a lot. It redshifted the absorption by 160 nanometers. So now we're going into the visible. It had transformed the photochemical quantum yield from 5% to 75%. So suddenly, a big fraction of the photons were actually stored. But it also increased the mass. So the energy density went down from 1,000 to 270. And finally, the storage time also went down drastically. So this was the first generation system that was made by, by Victor, who uh, did his master's thesis by then. He later did a PhD in the group and went to Cambridge to study advanced photophysical systems. And now he's leading his own group in Uppsala University. Uh, so the next generation system, uh, we took the, the acceptor part and removed the benzene ring, basically. So we have a cyano group now. It's much lighter. And, and behind every generation, every story, there is a, a, something like this. And I don't know how many of you are uh, a chemist, organic chemist, but, but, but it's not coming automatically. We just uh, come up with an idea. We want this molecule, and then we go and make it. It's often, uh, there has to be some kind of uh, new development or new discovery on, on the methodology on how to make it. And in this case, uh, we developed a new route to get to this uh, bromochloro that was more healthy and practical on larger scale. And then we went uh, through this, and then we could finally do a, a cross-coupling cross reaction to form this class of, of molecules. Um, uh, I, I will not uh, spend too much time on this, but just mention that the majority of our time goes into, <laughs> goes into things like this. Um, it's not coming automatically, it can, be, it can take a year to develop a sequence like this or more. Uh, but the new, new set of materials that were made by Maria, she is also still at uh, Chalmers, maybe some of you have met her. Uh, she, she made these and uh, they were much lighter. So the, so the energy density, where do we have it? The energy density uh, went up a lot. Uh, actually, we, this one had 400 kilojoules per kilogram and this one 600. So this was uh, more than twice uh, what we set out to do. So already with a little bit of engineering, we could meet this target and we could measure using differential scaling cal calorimetry. Uh, we could see this exothermic uh, peak. So we photoconvert this, put it into the DSC pan and, and uh, heat it. And then by thermal activation, it uh, gets a big uh, exotherm of, uh, of, uh, of this many joule per kilogram. So it's very, it's, it's, I would not say it's easy, but you can, uh, you can, easy is also a forbidden word in, in my research group. Nothing is easy, always uh, challenges in different places. So we're not allowed to say easy, it's never easy. But, um, but uh, you can measure this in the DSC uh, and get out the, the thermal energy like that. Um, so if you compare, the, the best one of the old first generation with the next one, uh, you can see the molecular weight went down uh, and the energy density went up. 
but also we, we have this problem with the storage time is only uh, two to four, five hours. So we can only hold the energy for this little time. Um, then uh, we also tested the photoconversion. So here is a graph that shows uh, the absorbance, uh, uh, lambda max, and then we photoconvert it and no absorbance. And then we switch it back and we photoconvert it. And we do that 125 times. Uh, don't worry, this was an automated setup. So there was not no student sitting and switching the lamps uh, here. It was, he was smart enough to, to make a computer controlled uh, switching system so that uh, over the course of uh, two to three days, uh, this could be recorded. So this is a little bit not directly uh, related to, to the work, but if you are working with something where there's a lot of experiments, try to think about how you can automate it. I mean, it, maybe it takes a little time to set up a controlled uh, lamp switch uh, here, but, but the quality of <clears throat> the result is much higher and you can go and have a coffee or do something else over the weekend. Uh, so it uh, has helped a lot, just some small automation like this, making a big, big difference. Um, so with that, we had the, the good energy storage. We had very good for us uh, optical properties. You see the first molecule is very absorbing and it's becoming completely transparent. And then uh, we can treat it many times. Uh, but um, I told you that I wanted to store the energy, but this five hours is maybe a little bit disturbing. Uh, this is not a long uh, period of time. So what can we do about that? Uh, and, and here comes, um, what we first thought was a, a very difficult problem, and, and it is still a somewhat difficult problem because we are using here the HOMO and the LUMO of one part of the molecule that has to interact with some uh, sigma orbitals in the what is going to be the quadricyclic. So these are the involved orbitals of the excited state and the ground state. And if we bring this down, then this crossing point also goes down, and this is related to the position of this peak here. So every time we try to bring this down to improve the absorption onset, we also bring down this barrier. And that is why the new molecules uh, release the energy much, much faster than the original one. So what can we do about that? Uh, if we plotted all our molecules, or at least some of our molecules here, they follow this, that, that if they have a long wavelength absorption, they have a small barrier. So this goes, this goes down, this goes down. It's very much following this trend. Oh, sorry. And we want to be uh, out here. We want to have long storage and good absorption. So that's what we want. So how could we do that? So I'm going to give you a few, uh, two examples of how we have been working with this. The first one, uh, is this one. We, we, we found out that we thought, what if we connect two systems? Then we first we have uh, a, a long high system here that is a good absorber, can absorb a big part of the solar spectrum. Uh, and we know that it has a low barrier. That was what we just discussed. But when we switch the first molecule here, then it becomes a smaller absorber with a not so good absorption but the higher barrier. So if we switch it two times, we end up in a locked state with a high barrier. So in this way, we use uh, the sort of the, the Huckel system here, the length of the high conjugated system and lock it, the molecule and the energy into this uh, final form. And uh, this uh, actually worked. So, so these are the molecules that we made and, and uh, we synthesize them. And, and if we switch the first one here, the storage time is only seven minutes, but if we switch into the second one, it's locked in for, for three days. That is, uh, I think, this one. And the other one, if we switch it once, two days, and again, it becomes uh, 10 days. So, so in this way, we can sort of lock in, we make a little way to keep on a molecular level the, the energy in there. Um, so it improves uh, to some extent, uh, and we have very high energy densities because we also share the heavy part of the molecule between two energy storage units. So in this way, 
we get all the way up to uh, 900 kilojoules per kilogram, which is a quite significant uh, amount of energy, actually. Uh, but what more could we do? So in this um, second work, uh, it was not as planned. I mean, some, some, the first story here, it was something we had thought out. This should work, and then we went and make it, made it. The other one was uh, different here. Uh, Marty and Anne, they had made a large family of molecules. You see this aryl means uh, all these different substituents. And uh, I thought, I asked them, uh, how is it going? Uh, anything special with your, with your molecules? And they said, nah, not really. Okay, so I said, oh, let's just um, characterize it and see if we can publish uh, this. And that they did. Uh, it took some, uh, quite some time because it was uh, a lot of molecules. But much to our surprise, uh, something uh, uh, unforeseen it was there. So if you look at this substituent, this uh, thiophene unit, it stored the energy for, for 0.2 days, so a few hours. But the other one had 22 days, so 100 times more. And there's only the difference of a little connection point here. So it's just a slight molecular shape change. This one up here had six years, seven years, and uh, 18 years for this one. And this was around 200 times more than the corresponding isomer. So there was something strange going on with these five molecules that first we could not uh, understand. And we had to think quite long time to figure out what it was. So uh, what it is, uh, is uh, so these new ones they are out here oh, sorry they're out here they are all uh, performing unreasonably much better than the rest so what is happening is unfortunately i forgot this slide i want to show you but what is happening here is that um, in the no bonadine form uh, there's restricted rotation here especially if you have um, something sitting here in the auto position then you go to the quadricyclane form you can uh, rotate a little bit more freely because this becomes uh, more compact. But moreover, the transition state um, energy of the different conformations, if you start to calculate the different conformations around this and, and the transition state it has to go through, only certain conformations allow you to transfer, travel back to your, where you, you, to your starting point. So therefore, we are sort of engineering we are using entropy and engineering the energies of the transition state, and by that blocking the ability to go back. And this gives this factor 200 roughly in the energy storage time. So we are really doing transition state engineering, and we needed quite high level computational work by a group of Paul Erhard to, to understand this. And this become the most sort of viewed and shared top three paper of, in the history of the uh, chemistry European uh, journal. And I think still today, uh, four years later, it's still a top five paper. So uh, it's, uh, it was very uh, big interest in this uh, work. Uh, then, um, yeah, uh, I don't know how much time I have. I'm speaking a little bit slower than normal, but that was intended. Um, then uh, one thing is about how we make the molecules. Um, let me just see what comes here. I will skip that actually. Uh, okay, so at, at that time we had made, we started with the original molecules. We had made three different types of variations. The, the lighter donor acceptor ones, the one that shared the donors, and finally the one that had sort of this uh, uh, transition state engineering uh, uh, concept. Uh, the next question is, can we use this for anything? Or can we, can we try to show how this could be useful for something at least? Um, and, and here, uh, go back a few uh, years, uh, we have had these two uh, molecules uh, available. And they absorb in the UV or in the blue end of the solar spectrum. So they were not super efficient light absorbers. So we thought, how can we utilize these and the rest of the solar spectrum. And the idea was then to combine this with a, a water heating system because these are transparent to all other colors of light. So if we absorb energy here, the rest of the, the, what is not absorbed goes into the water and then we can utilize a big part 
of the solar spectrum. So actually, the efficiency of the chemical system was 1.1%, and the water heating system around 80%. So we utilize, in principle, 80% of incoming photons uh, uh, to heat something. So no electricity in the system. Um, if we wanted to improve this further, uh, we later uh, started to think a little bit about uh, this with energies and the maximum efficiency. And, and one way to go is a little bit like in solar cells, you have this multi-junction solar cells. You can also try to design a system with several molecular photo switches, and then the maximum efficiency goes up from around 13% up to 20% if you had fully optimized molecules. And we, we, we recently showed in December last year uh, how we could do this with three different photo switches operating at different wavelengths, but still efficiency is not very high. There's still a lot to do in, in these systems to make them really efficient. Uh, another way of working around this um, has become uh, very fashionable since we started uh, uh, about uh, eight, uh, 10 years ago, uh, is uh, something called uh, photon up conversion. So we had this problem that we can only use the blue photons, but we want to use uh, all of the photons. And if we don't want to change the molecules, uh, and we can, um, maybe we should try to change the sun instead. So we should, uh, so, uh, so what can we do to change the color of the sunlight, basically? This could help us in many different processes, not only our chemistry, but also other photochemical processes. If the sun just had a different color, it would be great for photochemistry. So what can we do with this? Uh, the idea here is to, to have a layer that harvests uh, the blue photons and use that, and then another layer that receives the green and the yellow and the red and upconvert it and send it back as blue photons. So how can this be done? Um, uh, if we look at normal uh, fluorescence, uh, we shine light with a particular green laser and out come a red emission, right? It's a lower energy. But what we want to have is uh, this. We want green to blue. And um, how can this happen? Because we are going from uh, energy like this to energy like this. How, uh, how is this? We have to, con so we cannot make out energy of nothing, right? So, so this is possible through a process called triplet triplet uh, annihilation photon up conversion. And, um, and we start with what is called a sensitizer. It gets uh, excited. And then it spin flips into a triplet state. And then it transfers its energy to another molecule called an annihilator and uh, excites that. And when you have two of these, both of them in a triplet state. If they, are, if they meet and, and a lot of things are working correctly, then uh, they will flip, is, exchange the energy and the, one of them will end up in a high energy excited single state. And uh, that can then uh, emit a photon. So this sounds uh, very complicated and very magical, and it also is. <clears throat> but uh, through the last 10 years, uh, an amazing development in this field has happened and I'm not going, this would need uh, another two hour lecture to go through all the things that have happened there. <clears throat> but a long story short, back in 2012, uh, we actually made one of the first examples of a, a photochemically driven uh, a process using up conversion, which is uh, this one. Um, uh, and let me form this blue photon. So we use this uh, system. And, and uh, we use uh, sensitizer, triplets, triplet energy transfer into the singlet, and then the emission and a blue photon out. And, uh, and then the blue photon has higher energy than the original photon. So, uh, so this was the, the energy storage system looked a little bit different back then. Uh, this absorbed uh, as the green curve here. This is the emission of uh, diphenyl anthracene, the blue one, you can see they overlap, and this is a sensitizer, so we can use light from 500 up to 550 to drive the, the process. And we actually decided to use uh, white light, so we had this high intensity lamp, everything was cooled in water, we had to plug up some blue photons to 
to demonstrate the process, but uh, but it actually uh, worked, and um, and um, this uh, became then uh, the cover of this uh, journal where we could improve the efficiency of the process by 130 percent by enabling a larger part of the solar spectrum to be used, and 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 this was done in 2011, 2012. Today, uh, this system, the upconversion system, has an efficiency of a few percent. Uh, today, and it had to be in ultra oxygen free and all that. Today, uh, we can do it in air with uh, 10 times higher efficiency. And people are putting this on solar cells and trying to show how you can improve solar cells by locally changing the color of the sun. So this research field, I mean, you would have, if you looked at what we had or others had in 2011, 2013, you would say, this is impossible. But today, basically, we have a, a plastic film we can paint onto something and it works and it comes out uh, blue photons uh, or other colors of photons. Um, uh, this is an example where we try to do uh, a larger scale experiment uh, outside. This is uh, Anna Ruffy that's now working at the uh, Imperial College, uh, University College of London, and Xi'ang is still in the group. Uh, this is a little video. I don't know if this will work or it did work, but uh, I, I don't think I can show it like this. Okay, anyways, uh, after having worked with this type of materials for, for many years, we thought, now we want to heat something, right? <laughs> it's about storing energy and releasing it as heat. When will I get my hot coffee? It's still a little bit out in the future, but but then, but then we had to do something about it. And, and we started to figure out that very simple things, such as if you want to heat something, uh, it's important to know the heat capacity and the mass, right? That's what we just learned in the other, in the other talk. And then it becomes, impossible, it becomes important to understand what makes the system. We have our molecules and the, uh, and the mass of the molecules, but we also have the solvent. And we also have the, the reactors and everything. Everything weighs something and everything has to be heated. So, so down here in the, what we can get out, we have to put everything that weighs something and the heat capacities of everything we are working with. And the top here is the storage in the molecules and how much molecule we have. So summa summarum is that we need to have a lot of molecules in as little solvent as possible. We need to have uh, high solubility. And our original molecule didn't really make it with 34 grams per liter. So the next one, uh, this one we call the super molecule, had 338 grams per liter uh, in toluene and should give us a 65 degrees of the thermal gradient when we release the, the heat. Um, so, so this is the, what they made. And, and then we developed a catalyst system that could trigger the heat release. So this is the first experiment molecule come in here. We monitor how much energy is in the color of the molecule. We monitor the temperature, pump it over the catalyst, monitor the temperature when it comes out, and, and uh, document that it's converted and, and measure the heat uh, release like this. This is a very small device. It's by one millimeter by four millimeter. So you can imagine if you generate heat here, a lot of it will dissipate to the surroundings. So next, next step was to do the same experiment in a high vacuum. So this is a high vacuum chamber with the tubing inside. And there uh, on, a, on one uh, lucky day, it uh, actually we saw that we could release a lot of heat about the 50 degrees uh, temperature gradient. Uh, and with a little bit of engineering uh, and looking at the change in concentration uh, and in the observed temperature, we could get up to uh, 63, 64 degrees uh, heat release. Uh, so uh, 85 degrees uh, actual temperature. And this is uh, still today uh, the world record in uh, such uh, systems. Um, later, we went on and um, engineered the system further and got a little bit better uh, properties. And uh, this is a recent uh, example that just got published. And uh, we could show that we could run it continuously for here, it's a 50, 60 cycle uh, with catalysis and, and, and continuously operate the system uh, over, uh, I think, a, a week without any significant uh, degradation. 
And um, this, if it works, yeah, this we could then combine uh, the, the heat we released there, we could combine in two different ways with a thermoelectric generator, uh, something that maybe you are working on. This is a special thin thermoelectric generator developed at the Shanghai Jiao Tong University in Shanghai. So here we pump in the molecule here, we uh, release the heat, it goes into the TG and out comes uh, some uh, voltage. We can also put our molecule on as a, a thin film and then trigger the heat release with a stimuli and, and then heat up the surface and uh, drive uh, the TG uh, device. And this uh, actually uh, last week was called the coolest uh, thing on, on earth uh, by a general electric uh, company. And actually that was written in more than 300 news articles about uh, this paper uh, during the last two weeks, the combined reach of uh, 480 million uh, people. So it uh, created quite some, some interest uh, from different uh, uh, people around the world. So <clears throat> now I've showed you different types of devices, how we try to capture the energy, release it, and also convert into electric power. Uh, I don't know, I have five minutes left or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so you could say that these systems are still very uh, low efficiency and not working that well. Uh, and I would say it's true. We are working on making them better. But one could also try to think about <clears throat> where, what other properties do they have that maybe could be useful? There are not so many energy storage systems that are fully transparent or partially transparent and where the energy capture and the storage is the same material. It's not, it's not so many examples of that. So, so what could we do with this? Uh, and one of the ideas is to, to integrate it into a window. This is an illustration of how it could look. Uh, because uh, during the day, we often have too high temperatures. And maybe you have tried to sit in an office <clears throat> that's uh, nicely directed through south, towards the south and the sun comes up and the temperature of the office comes up. And, and then uh, maybe the building has some uh, blinds that can uh, keep the, the sunlight out. And then you pull the blinds down. But then you don't have a window anymore because a window by definition is something you can look through. But uh, often you have to put up, this is an old fashioned blinds like this to keep the heat out, right? So, so what you really would like to have is a transparent window that could take out some of the sun energy during the day and release it during the night. This is at least what we think. So we, we, the idea is we, what we really want is to have a stable, comfortable indoor temperature, but we still want to feel, see the world outside. We don't want to be in a closed uh, office with no windows. So how do we try to solve this? We could maybe try to put in our molecules and maybe level out this curve uh, in part. So this is uh, the first example. This is a thin film of this molecule. It can now capture 3.8% of the incoming energy. It's yellow, but when you shine light on it, it becomes uh, fully transparent. Um, here's a video. Again, I don't know if I can start the video. Can you start the video there with the, with the mouse? Uh, ah, so you see it now, it's yellow, comes out in the sun, and it becomes fully transparent. So this is the norbornadiene converted to protocyclane, and there's a color change so that it's uh, fully transparent. Um, so this is uh, how we think it should look. And uh, then we are now uh, working on uh, refining this and, and measuring and uh, improving the molecules and figuring out how much energy can you actually store, how much will you release, and what will it mean? So with the molecules we have today, uh, we will maybe reduce the temperature a fraction of a degree in the first hours of the day until all material is converted. And then during the night, we will increase the temperature with a few fractions, a uh, few degrees. So it's very small effects, and uh, we need to improve this to make it uh, viable for future window technology, but we are, we are working on it. <laughs> so these are the temperature differences. This is the without any, and then with different molecules. 
And this is uh, explored in this uh, startup uh, company. Uh, we're also trying to do the whole thing on a larger scale, uh, trying to make more efficient variants of our, of our energy capture and heat release devices and make the, everything larger. And uh, this is a collaboration between research groups and universities and company in UK, Germany, and Spain and Denmark and Sweden. <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, we are working with new chemistry routes. Uh, uh, this is a flow chemistry uh, setup where we in one day now can produce uh, almost 100 grams of molecules without having to, to do much work uh, ourselves. Uh, we have a machine that can do the work now uh, and, and, and produce 87 grams in, in eight hours. Uh, <clears throat> finally, <clears throat> I'm going to, to show you something that I think would be interesting to many of you because you work with, many of you work with phase change and heating. And, and, <clears throat> and this is an example of what we're trying to do something I think is, uh, is a little bit different and, and, and new here. So we have a photo switch system like the one I showed you before. This is a slightly different one uh, where uh, we start here in a, in a crystalline form and we shine light on it and it melts. And uh, in the melting process, it absorbs the uh, heat from the surroundings, but it also stores energy from the photo conversion. When we then trigger the back conversion with light, it becomes uh, liquid and then crystallizes. So in this way, we harvest not only energy from the photons, but also from the surroundings. So, and, and, um, and we create a phase change material where the melting point is controlled by the state of the photo switch. So we, we, you, we have a phase change material that switches properties, switches melting point, depending on if we are in one isomer or the other isomer. What does this mean in practice? Uh, this is how it was engineered, how they made 12 different, comp uh, actually 24 different compounds to get the right properties. And these are the melting points of the trans isomer and the cis isomer. And the challenge is to get the distance and the difference in the melting points as large as possible to create an operational space where you can go leave or join the liquid or the solid space. So uh, this is uh, very interesting because then we could shine light on it, it becomes liquid. We could release the energy, it crystallizes and, and give you the energy back. Um, so basically you can draw a cycle like this, where you start with a, a solid, you shine light, it spontaneously melts, um, you shine light, you, um, you form this, and then you crystallize, uh, you go around like this. So this is what you could look uh, as under a thermal camera. So here's a thin film, looks like this. You use a, a pulse of light, trigger the release of energy and it heats up about 27 degrees. So you release about 2000 watt per kilogram locally uh, during a course of a few seconds. And you can also store the energy, put it in the fridge and get this frozen surface and then trigger the heat release and then melt the ice by the by the stored chemical energy. We are, of course, we did the control experiment. There's not a lot of energy in the trigger light pulse here. So without that, you cannot do it. So in this way, you, you create a photochemically controlled uh, um, de-icing system. Uh, yeah. um, so in this type of systems, we don't only use the solar energy, we also absorb heat from the ambient and we release it as upgraded heat. I also showed you how we can do power and maybe in the future, we will be able to also do cooling with some of these system by engineering uh, the properties. So uh, thank you very much. And sorry for if I get, no, went over. This is a lot of uh, collaborations with different research groups, uh, some sponsorships from, from companies uh, helping us in different ways. And uh, this is the, the current group members and the past group members, 
and some of the uh, funding agencies. Uh, and uh, as uh, Mariano said, uh, now we are in uh, primarily here in Spain and sponsored uh, by uh, ICREA uh, Foundation. So uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Time for questions. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I was just curious about the monitoring of the um, of the power energy conversion yeah. by NMR. Yeah. How do you do that experimentally? Do you have to take alloc quotes? Or... By NMR? So NMR can only tell us the state of what we have. So the NMR can only tell us how much we have of this molecule and that molecule. It cannot measure the heat. We use normally DSC or, or thermocouples. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, more like experimentally because you, the, your molecule cannot see the light, right? So you have to take from your system to the NMR or... Ah, okay. So, so there are a number of ways we can monitor the two different states. Basically, what you're asking, how do you know how much is charged, right? So the one way is... Um, Photochemistry, uh, photo, photo, the absorption. So the color of the molecule changes drastically. You see it actually here by eye. In, in this example, you saw it went from yellow to transparent. So you can, you can follow it by UV spectroscopy or just by eye. If it's yellow, it's not charged. If it's transparent, it's charged. But you can also, if you want to be more precise, you can do uh, UV spectroscopy. And that is what we did. In this experiment, we, we went from sorry, that was jumping, but we went from uncharged to fully charged and back again. But of course, the UVVs doesn't tell you much about what's going on in the molecule. That's in MR tells you a little bit more about the structure and so on. So of course we do in MR a, a, a lot. I but don't know if this answered your question. I, I'm I'm confused about the the taking your sample to the NMR. Because what, what, you cannot do any more in situ, right? But I can do UVVs in situ. But ah, so, so some of the molecules have some of the molecules have half lives of the uh, eighteen years. So you have enough okay. time to to go to the NMR. Okay, okay, okay. Some of them have two hours. Then you walk a little bit faster. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> some some of them have seconds. Then you give up. So um, so we have we had a recent paper with a class of molecules where it was exactly what you say there. Where we, we actually went to, to a specialist in NMR where we had everything prepared and we sit with a lamp and then doof directly in just to see try to see something. So so it's 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 a valid question. It depends a lot on the molecule. We also have in our group a uh, um, benchtop NMR so that we can actually go directly from the tubing into the NMR with a, at a millisecond delay. Uh, so then it's just the recording time of the NMR spectrum. Uh, but So it is a valid question. It depends a lot on the molecules we're working with. Some of them is absolutely no problem. Some of them it's a serious thing. Then you can try to, it's a thermally induced reaction. So you can try to cool. So this is a general trick for people working with this kind of systems. If they are switching fast, then process goes slower when you cool. So then you can try to, do your photochemical experiment at minus 20 degrees or minus 80 degrees, or some specialist can do photochemistry in, in argon matrix. But, uh, and then you can see some things that we cannot see at room temperature. Uh, but that's another specialized thing. So if you cool, everything goes slower. Then maybe you can study these effects. Hmm? More questions? So thank you very much for this really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering about the devices that you made in tandem, uh, where you put your your material in contact with a fluid to extract the heat, and then at the bottom you put yeah. the water. Yeah. What kind of fluid do you use uh, uh, yeah. to avoid like the deterioration of your sample? Yes, um, this is actually one of the. Right now we're using uh, toluene, and that we use because we can use deuterated toluene, so we can do NMR. Um, but but in the future we need to have a, a more a less toxic, less flammable fluid. And this is um, I cannot tell you much about it because uh, we have a grant agreement in the 
consortium. But uh, this is an important point. If you want to go towards uh, real applications, toluene is a flammable solvent. Uh, you don't want to use that. So, so we are we're working on alternatives. Okay. okay thank you. Uh -huh. So thank you very much. Very nice. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I mean, my obvious question would be, uh, if you take this example, uh, yeah. what, what do you need to achieve more in order to, or, or you are already better than, I mean, removing your most, so you want to make this uh, uh, on demand, right? So yeah. basically, instead of converting the heat gradient into electricity, yeah. you are storing uh, energy and you convert into electricity only when, when you want. I guess yeah, this yeah, is yeah. The, the idea behind that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One way to do that, it's obvious, right? It's uh, to, convert, to, to store yeah. the, uh, uh, the, the charges that are coming out of the thermal electric generator into a rechargeable battery, whatever. Mm -hmm. So with respect to this scheme, which is what uh, the obvious one for, for, mm -hmm. for other kinds of devices, wh wh where are you or what, what uh, so what do you need to to do more or what, in which uh, way you are already better or so if you could. Uh, uh, compared uh, to other technology. No, but uh, just the same. So instead of uh, uh, coupling a thermal electric generator with your materials, yeah. I could couple a thermal electric generator with uh, uh, an, uh, another kind of storage, which is uh, an electrochemical storage, like a, a, a rechargeable battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I mean, so this we is obvious. Uh, we are not uh, competing. You, 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 could, you could do similar, uh, what we envision would be, effectively doing similar to a solar cell and a battery. Uh, and that exists, uh, if, you, if you think about small scale app companies trying to do, uh, for example, headphones with solar cells and batteries, so they automatically uh, charge. So it just came on the market the last year, a Swedish company doing this, and I know several others are, are doing similar things. So our pocket calculators in the old days had, had a little, uh, so I'm not, I don't know yet if this can be uh, any better, but it's, it, as I see it now, it's mostly at this level, a demonstration of an alternative. So, so here there are no battery technologies, there are no advanced capsulation technologies, there are no uh, cobalt or lithium. It's a, so it's, a, it's, it's trying to say, okay, out of curiosity, can we make an, an alternative? I, I, I don't know if it can be better in any ways, but it's more, from the starting point, a little bit curiosity driven, can we make alternatives? And, and then maybe it can be useful for something, maybe not, but we try to go a little bit, I mean, we don't only make the molecules, we try to go a little bit towards something that looks like it would be useful with more development. And, and one of the things that could happen up here would be, what, is, what the material is actually doing is you can also store energy in a block of uh, stone or iron or something heavy, right? Um, you get with the CP and the mass, it's more, it follows quite linearly for almost all materials. But here you are actually creating materials that are light but have a high thermal mass. So you, you, go, you, you go into a materials property space that does not exist in other materials. I don't know what it's good for. Uh, but we are trying to, that is a, because you could also make a window that was uh, very thick of glass and it will also stabilize the temperature. Uh, we can make a thin window that can maybe stabilize the temperature. So, so, it's a, so we, are, we are creating a materials uh, space that was not really possible before. I don't know if it's useful, but we start by trying to do it. <laughs> and then uh, let me see how far we get. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, for the window coatings, I was wondering if if the the idea is still to to store the energy and then trigger the release on demand, or or there's some way to to tune that energy yeah, barrier yeah, so that yeah. the energy is just being yeah. released maybe so, twelve hours yeah, after being that's captured. That's what we are. That's what we are aiming for. First, so we can we can now tailor the release rate from from seconds to years. And here we would choose a molecule with this six to 12 hour time. And this is uh, one of the things that is simulated in this paper I mentioned is what should be the, the rates and what will it mean uh, exactly this. Yeah. But, but for the, the release of uh, the energy for these thin films, it's, it's not possible with a catalyst, right? It has to then be some, some energy input in or, or it's still 
Um, I mean, with the with the liquid, uh, yeah. you're running it over a catalyst, no, to, to yeah. release the energy. But with a thin film, it's the thin film is more. There's no catalyst, so there's it's just spontaneous heat release. Or in the, in the last system I showed, this was another molecular system where you could control it with two different wavelengths of light. Okay. So the the one form was I think green light, the other one was red light, yeah. and then you could switch in both directions. So it's a it's good for a demonstration like this, but if you put it out in the sun, you have you're triggering both, so you have to do something about that. So, so that is, um, yeah, that was what I mentioned in the first in the beginning of the talk that this this competing process can be good or bad for control. It can be good, but for putting things just out in the sun, maybe it's not what you want. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if you have some uh, tried different structures. I remember every uh, structure you use uh, is based on nominal dyings. Yeah. And uh, is there any other yeah. structure yeah. that yeah. can yeah. be used yeah. for this? Yeah. So the most so so I would say that now uh, the most of the work in ninety I mean also beyond my group. 95% are done on, or maybe 98% are done on, on the three structures I showed in the beginning here, in the first one of the first slides coming now. Uh, yeah, so most work is done on these three classes of structures. Um, this, the last one I showed was based on uh, this atropentine system, which um, has undergone a very big improvement in the last three years. There has been a lot of improvements. Um, this still has the, by far the highest energy density, but this has some advantages in robustness. Um, I still, this is still our favorite system, but we are also sometimes working on, on this and other groups are working on, on this one. So this has definitely the highest energy density of any system, but, but these, are, these are coming nearer and nearer. Uh, many groups working with atropensines and only two groups in the world working with this. So they are they are getting closer, but they, we are trying to get ahead again. So it's a, this is like, a, with, this is good. It's good. It's nice to, I mean, when I started this work, there was very few people doing it. Now there are more groups working on this concept and it's nice to see how it's really evolving. Uh, and, and one of the advantages of the ATSU system is that they have made them absorb in the IR, for example. So you can span the whole spectrum with these. This is quite cool. Okay, thank you. Coffee time? Yeah, so thank you again. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you.